Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Dean Rogers. Welcome back to the Dean Rogers Show. Today, we've got another very special guest, Mr. Eric Brewer. What's up, Eric? What's up, Dean? What's up? What's up? Dude, I'm, I'm stoked to get in uh, to today's episode. Uh, guys, if you don't know Eric yet, Eric has done over 3,000 residential real estate deals in Pennsylvania and Maryland. Um, he's done pretty much every transaction you can dream of, you know, all the, the purchase, uh, renovation, direct to seller, marketing, novations, turnkey rentals, property management, wholesale deals, the whole nine yards. So wealth of knowledge, wealth of experience. Uh, he's the owner of Integrity First Home Buyers. Love that name. And currently does 350 deals a year and has a team of about 40 team members and has some C-level people on the team, basically a whole full executive leadership team. So that's pretty incredible to get to that level, to that scale. So I can't wait to dive into that. Before we get started, Eric, where can people find you on Instagram and social media? Uh, best place to find me is on Instagram at Eric underscore Brewer underscore invest. All right. So Eric underscore Brewer underscore invest. Find them there on social media. Make sure you connect with them. All right. So, dude, uh, you've done some things. You've been investing since 2006. Um, how, how the heck did you even get started in real estate? Um. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I actually, um, my first sort of real job after serving in the U.S. Army was at a car dealership. I started as a, what they call a lot porter. So I would just move cars around, help the service department uh, deliver vehicles, occasionally would move inventory around for the new car, uh, used car uh, managers. And um, I just worked really hard and stayed out of trouble. And after a series of promotions, I ended up in sales and then uh, finance manager and then sales manager and then eventually general sales manager. And uh, so I ended up doing that for eight years. I was in the automotive business um, and ended up at a pretty high level in management after eight years and uh, just got burned out uh, after eight years. That, that business has a way of taking its toll on you. Um, at least when I worked in the car business, they were pretty common to have 70, 75 hour work weeks, most weekends, literally every evening. And uh, I was just becoming a father at that point uh, and uh, knew that I may have to make a choice between being a good car guy and being a good dad and uh, decided I wanted to be a good dad mm. and uh, got out of the car business, did some soul searching for a while Um tried to find something that was going to leverage my experience in sales, but not put me right back in, you know, to the car business that I was looking to get away from and ended up taking a job as a um, mortgage consultant, basically cold calling refi leads and uh, decided to go into the, the finance aspect of real estate because in my experience in the, the car business, we had a significant advantage where I worked because of our uh, breadth of understanding to all things finance. Like we could help people with bad credit. We could help people that owed way too much on their trade. We could help people that had never developed any credit. We could help people that, you know, had perfect credit and were super rate conscious and had a bunch of money down. Um, so I said, you know what, if I'm going to learn real estate, let me get a good sort of foundation in finance. So I started uh, in a mortgage company, did that for about six months. And then Surprisingly enough, my old mentor from the car business was getting into real estate, looking for a partner and called me and asked me if I wanted to flip houses together. Literally, like, that's what he said, hey, man, you want to flip houses? And I was like, what do you mean flip houses? In 05, that wasn't <laughs> like a, a super mainstream career path. And uh, we had lunch, had a couple phone calls and decided to work together flipping houses. And that was in February of 2006 when I got started. Wow. So you you worked your way up. And we're doing well in in the car business. Yeah. Was it just those long hour grinds? Yeah, I mean, that was certainly part of it. I think the other thing that I remember is like the whole like just interaction. Like literally from when whether you're a consumer, 
like most car salesmen don't love selling cars and literally nobody likes buying a car. It, it's just a, it's just not a, a, a pleasurable experience for anybody involved. Right. Like, yeah. Um, so I remember like each time I felt like I would introduce myself to a new customer, I was spending the first 30 minutes, like trying to unwind years of horrible experiences they had at other dealerships with other salespeople. So it was the hours. And then I think just like the, the customer to salesperson relationship is just not, a super friendly one. And I, I just, I didn't like that. Like I'm, I'm super big on having meaningful, you know, productive relationships. Um, and uh, it's really, really hard to do that as a car salesman. Yeah. You're not joking. I mean, that's, that's a, that's not an experience most people like it's, there's a lot of friction. Um, there's a lot of hard selling, uh, most people the process don't. hasn't changed in a hundred years. It's like, yeah. and nobody likes it, but we keep doing it the same way. Right. So yeah, it's just, it's, it's not fun. I think consumer reports, like it was a while ago, did a report and it was like visiting the dentist. And then number two was buying a car, like least desirable things for people to do. Um, number one was like literally getting teeth ripped out of your face. And a close second was going to buy a Honda, right. It's like, yeah. <laughs> just not a, a, a super desirable place to be. But, you know, I learned an awful lot from the car business. I'd go back and do it all over again. My time had just sort of passed. Yeah. Well, you said something interesting there. 2005 wasn't really a mainstream thing to be a, a flipper. Um, now with us being in the information age, I mean, and all the HGTV shows that tell yeah. about house flipping, it's made it sexy. It's made it interesting. It's made it accessible to darn near everybody, especially with all the how to get started with little to no money. So when you got started flipping, did you have money to do it? Did did you jump in, you know, leveraging relationships and other people's money? Like what was your way to get in? Yeah, I was very fortunate that my mentor and partner then, Craig Rich, um, was the owner of the Toyota franchise that I worked at. And, um, you know, he his, we did not have a liquidity problem. Mm -hmm. So um, he had had a pretty significant exit from the sale of the dealership. Um, had worked really hard for a really long time in the car business, even before being an owner. And we were able to, to operate with a pretty significant amount of money and capital to be able to do um, literally anything we wanted to do. I mean, within reason, right? We started very small. We were buying like $30,000 homes that needed $30,000 renovations and would sell for a hundred. Um, so we started very small. And fortunately, where I am in Pennsylvania, real estate's always been in comparison to across the country, it's super inexpensive. Like our median house price here now is two seventy, right? Yeah. And I think across the country, the median is like over four hundred. So right. uh, it's one of those markets that you know has a low upside but a a, a super high floor. Um, so yeah, we started off buying you know little three bed one bath row homes in the city for thirty grand. Cut our teeth, made some mistakes. Um, limped our way out profitably out of those first couple and just learned little by little. So, um, yeah, I was very fortunate that when I got my start, um, I had a, a partner that was, you know, in a good cash position. So um, yeah, it certainly helped in the beginning. Now, did either of you have experience flipping houses or did it just seem like a good idea? No, we actually went to, <laughs> there's a brick and mortar investing school in Baltimore County called Investors United. They're still open to, to this day. I think we spent like 15 grand for a six month, uh, you know, mentoring curriculum coaching program. And we went down and they taught us how to, back then you actually had to like go to the courthouse and pull lists. There, there wasn't all these, at least we didn't know about it or it wasn't wildly advertised these list sources and, you know, different mm -hmm. places you could buy lists. You had to go to the courthouse and manually pull that stuff. They'd teach you how to, what they called contract engineering, which really was assignment language and, you know, different contingencies in the contract. And then um, how to hire a contractor, how to build a scope of, of work and a budget. And um, I think we went for about three months and they got to the negotiating portion and we were like, ah, I think we're okay on the negotiating part. We're just going to go try our luck and start making a bunch of offers. So we paid for like this six month course. We went to three months worth of it and then just went out and started buying houses. We felt like we had enough information to be dangerous. Did you, or did you miss out on some important info? 
Um, I would say we certainly had to miss out on some important info, but we were uh, probably more assertive than, than than the situation called for. Uh, again, when you look at our, like literally, I think that's what helped shorten our learning curve is the car business. There's a lot of parallels to flipping yep. homes, right? Like you go to the auction, you buy a fixer upper car, you bring it back in the service department, you fix some stuff, other stuff you just disclose and say, hey, this may need replaced. And you mark it up and you sell it to an end user. Um, so I feel like we had enough information to get started. And um, we were just, it was a nightmare to sit in like a four hour class when all I wanted to do was go talk to buyers and sellers to sit there and try and study and you know, um, take all this information. And so, yeah, I'm sure we missed some valuable information, but um, we were a little anxious to get started. So what did things look like then when you were marketing, when you were looking for deals, was it just strictly auction properties, on-market properties, or were you doing off-market deals? Uh, We did probably at that point, 80% on-market. Like you could buy a reasonable amount of deals off the MLS. We bought a bunch of properties at the sheriff's sale. We bunch a bunch of public auctions in Pennsylvania are super popular for like estates and probate um, and people moving into like an assisted care. Public auctions are a real popular way to sell your home. So we bought most of our stuff on market at that point, renovated everything, and then worked really hard to try and sell it. Yeah. So what, what do the things look like now? I mean, you've done 3,000 deals, you've scaled to doing 350 a year, you got a full several dozen room full of people on a team. Um, you know, what, what did you have to do? What was, that tr- what was that progress like to get there? I would say to you, you and I talked about this, right? And to try to not speak in generalities and give people actual items of that they can execute on. Yeah. I went from my focus being the development and, and making of deals to the the development and 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 elevation of people around me. Um, because in the beginning, what I would do is I, I want to do more deals. I hired support. And all these people would do is everything I told them to do. And then about seven years ago, I realized that I would quickly reach capacity. Like I couldn't do 300 deals myself. I was miserable doing 250 deals by myself. And I just thought if I could get more help, I would be fine. And really what I needed to do was not hire help. I needed to to actually start delegating entire chunks of decisions off of my plate. I was the bottleneck. I didn't need more help. I needed less responsibility. Hmm. So now what it looks like is we effectively have a specialized person in nearly every aspect of our business that are 10 times better than I was at any of those and have an area of focus that they focus on each and every day. And uh, that's how we've gotten to where we are now. I had to get out of making all these decisions and working every deal and start to surround myself with um, skilled people in that. You know, We have the, the best marketing person. We have the best trainer when it comes to sales. I have the best operations person in charge of running the organization. We have a phenomenal relationship with people that manage my finances. Mm-hmm. So I started focusing more on people and less on property. Mm-hmm. Um, and now those people take mm-hmm. care of executing on our strategy every day. Yeah. So to break some of that down, what does your marketing look like? What type of marketing are you doing? How much of it are you doing? Um, yeah, let's, let's dive into that. Yeah. So we do, uh, as far as I know, a little bit of everything. So, uh, my number one, um, spend number one return on ad spend number one, um, unit count for deals is television. Uh, number two is PPC. Number three, uh, would be direct mail. Um, and then everything else is sort of close. We do radio, Facebook, obviously SEO, um, we work, uh, agent, um, referral relationships really, really hard. We have a dedicated person here in a position that we call business development that just constantly networks and nurtures relationships with agents, auctioneers, attorneys, property managers. So they're like on market people that have off market deals. Yeah. Right. So they're like licensed professional entities that come across these opportunities um, at the top of the food chain. And we try and make sure that we're top of mind to be able to help those people when when they come across an opportunity. So 
all in all across the the three markets that we're in, we spend just shy of $200,000 a month, generate about 400 inbound leads. Um, and we also do cold calling and texting, but that's a, for me, that's a much, much different process for an outbound lead to get it up to the qualified state. So we, we sort of treat those like a whole separate funnel, but, uh, yeah, we generate between four and 500 leads a month. Um, 90% are inbound. Um, and then between the two markets, we, we buy and sell about 40 properties a month. Okay. Now, what, what are the exit strategies for most of those deals these days? Um, it's about 40% um, wholesale, uh, 20% um, fix and flip or turnkey. So some level of renovation and then selling to an end user. And then about 40% are straight innovations. Okay. So that has that become a big part? Because obviously we talked about this before. Novations has become such a hot topic. Do you find that to be like the future? Or do you f- just think that it's a hot thing now or just a tool in the tool belt? Or what do you think about um, Novations? Yeah, I, I mean, I think in five years, it won't even be Novations. It'll just be the new way of doing wholesale real estate. Um, there's no reason why it wouldn't be. I mean, literally, so I've been doing Novations since two thousand nine, eight, nine, like way before it was popular. And I did it out of necessity. I I learned about Novations just because I was trying to find a way to circumvent FHA deed seasoning. And once I learned about the mechanics and the fact that I'd be renovating a house that I didn't own without the deed being recorded, I was like, eh, that doesn't work for me. But now I had this basic understanding of how Novations worked. And I started applying it to wholesale deals, right? Where I I would come across a a nice property where the seller was motivated, but wouldn't sell to me at MAO. And I said, Hey, I I can lock this up, novate it to a retail buyer at retail prices. And, uh, you know, we did like one or two and I was like, wow, that really worked. (laughs) I had to, you know, sort of get to a proof of concept. And then those deals were messy. There was horrible communication. The sellers were pissed off. The buyers were pissed off. The buyer's agent was mad. So each time we did one of those deals, we would tweak the process, um, improve you know our documentation to make sure that we were being super transparent with everybody involved. And now I've done over a thousand of them. Um, we do again about fifteen of those or so each and every month that otherwise wouldn't be deals. These are deals that the property is in too good a condition, the seller wants too much money, that a normal burr fix and flip or wholesale offer just would not work. Yeah. So I don't know why you wouldn't do the only reason in my eyes, people wouldn't do innovations because they don't know how, because you're already generating leads. We're already turning these opportunities away because we don't have a, an acquisitions or dispo strategy to fit them. It should today be a bold on part of your business, but moving forward should just be the way that you, you know, sort of qualify leads when they come in. Yeah. So everyone's got a little bit different of an approach, how to do it. I know you've got the brewer method. Um, what, what's your approach to pitching on novations? Um, so we actually call it with consumers, we call it our equity protection program. And effectively what I'll share with, with you, Dean is like, you know, at this point, I feel like we've, we've reached a, an impasse. Um, it sounds like you see some value in what we have to offer with the convenience of how we buy homes, but yet you've kind of reached a, a bottom line of an amount of money that you're just not willing to go below is, is that kind of what's going on. And they're going to go, yeah, you know, I really like what you guys offer, but I'm not going to give it away. Or Dean, that all sounds great, but you know, man, I'm just not in any hurry. I'm not in a rush. Like, you know, it's paid off. I don't, I don't really care if it sells today or six months from now, I got to get my 200. And I'll say, you know, honestly, we come across a lot of sellers that are in a similar situation as you, where they'd like to take advantage of the convenience of selling to someone like me, but yet they'd like to get a little bit more money than what me and probably every other investor has been willing to offer. So I put my head together with my partner or my investor or you know my team and I said, hey, how can we pay people more money when they have a decent house that's in pretty good shape, but still be a smart investor? And we racked our brains and you know we got together and what we came up with was this equity protection program. It allows me to give you more money you give me some more flexibility with how we get the deal done. And that allows me to be comfortable, you know, paying you more for the property, but still allows me to make a reasonable profit at the end. 
So that's how we transition from the cash offer, what we call you know price anchor, to where we sort of open their eyes to to getting more money, but attach a, a specific set of contingencies and circumstances to it. Yeah. Okay. Now at that time, at that point of the conversation, whether it's on the phone or in person, do you already have that number prepared for the novation? And what I'm and willing ready to offer. To, yeah. What and you're ready to present it. Or is this a, I'll um, come back to you and talk to you later thing? Oh, no, no, no. We always, I don't, yeah, we always make the offer on the spot. Um, so and that number should be, there's there's an MAO that's a wholesale driven number. And then there should be another number that you use when you're doing novations that we call CCRV, current condition retail value. All right. So it basically, is, if you think about it, like wholesale is always like MAO, ARV, minus rehab, Yep. And we're we're trying to predict what a, a cash buyer would pay for that property, assuming that our renovation's correct and they agree with our ARV. The CCRV says if I took the house in its current condition, I didn't sweep the front porch. Like I don't do any work to any of my innovations. Never, ever, ever. Um, unless it's like a credit or you know, there's there's something that the a buyer that we're already under contract with wants to get done before we go to settlement. Um, but current condition retail value, if I listed it today with a realtor and I allowed someone to do home inspections and appraisals, what would they pay for it? Minus my profit and commissions, that's what I can pay. So in some cases, it's 30, 40, 50, 60 thousand dollars more than MAO, and you can still make on average over twenty five thousand dollars per novation. Um, so you really should have an MAO that's a wholesale driven number and then a current condition retail value for each and every one of your appointments. Okay. So does that mean as part of your process, your team, when they run the values, they're looking at both ARV and CCRV? Correct. Okay. Now, when it comes to that process, I think that's really important because there's a couple different ways that I've heard people present it. I've heard it from the standpoint of, hey, let's let's look at what your options are, Mr. Seller. Let's sit down. You got option one, option two, option three. And that might be, here's your cash offer. Here's your novation offer. And you present that as with a, whatever terminology you want. And yep. here's your retail listing offer, right? Yeah. Here's the pros and cons of all three. Um, or with your the way you described it, I understand is, Hey, I'm here to make a cash offer. Here's your cash offer. Ooh, okay, it doesn't work. I have this other thing based on what you said. Here's here's something else I think that would work for you. Is that the the approach you go with? Yeah, and the reason we cap it at two is, and this is my belief, just based on my interaction with people, is that when you give them one offer, I think you almost <clears throat> push them to feel compelled to get a second opinion. Like I need something to compare it to, right? When you give someone two options, you give them permission to pick one. Mm -hmm. When you give them three, I worry that you confuse them. And a confused mind will will, will just hover in in indecision, right? So that's why we stick it too. Mm. Um, So yeah, I mean, it's it's, uh, that's just what works well for us. I feel like when you give people three options, they're confused. Right. Like they, they, they start to intermingle the, the benefits of one. Like I pay commission here. I don't pay commission here. For us, um, we reduce it to, to simplest. Here's quick, fast, easy, low. Here's not quite as quick, not quite as fast, not quite as easy, but a higher price point. And uh, again, for us, that, that uh, drastically increases our closing percentage, our profits. That's been the sweet spot for us is, is giving in those two options. Yeah. Okay. I like that. I like two, op- two, two option offer. That makes sense to me. Um, and they're never presented at the same time, right? It's always a follow-up option if yeah, because option it, one doesn't feel right. Yeah, because they called us for cash wholesale quick, right? Like generally that's, that's the, the message they respond to. So we'll start there. And then if they, you know, if we've negotiated a little bit and they're unwilling to come to, to where I feel is a number that, that we want to make a deal on wholesale terms, I'll say, well, hey, I could probably get you close to that number if you were just flexible on these few things with me. Um, it justifies the increase, so we're not arbitrarily just raising our number, right? And they go, well, why didn't you just give me a, a better deal in the beginning? Were you trying to take advantage yeah. of me? So it attaches some explanation to to why we were able to come up. And they go, well, all right, I understand. If I'm going to get more money, I got to give up a little bit of this convenience here. 
Um, and now we've basically disclosed and we've eliminated a lot of the hassle um, that comes with novations after you get a contract, right? Like people call me all the time, like, well, they won't allow showings. And I was like, well, what did you guys talk about when you signed the contract? Well, we didn't really get into it. Well, no wonder mm-hmm. they got a problem with it, right? It's all back so, to the expectations, right? Yeah, it forces you to be transparent when you say, well, I could come up if, and they go, well, if what? And now's our opportunity to be very clear about what an expectations would be in order for us to come up in price. Mm. What what have been what have become your favorite type of transactions? Do you have a favorite? Is it I like this one, I like that one, I like any um, of them? I mean, I still think nothing beats a super cheap wholesale deal that you can right like sell in two hours. And I mean, nothing beats just dirt cheap, right? Like best deal you've ever got in the world um, when you got literally thirty different options. What you do with it, right? You can set it on fire and make thirty grand. Right. Um, outside of that, I would say I've gravitated towards more of the, like, I love big ticket novation deals. We almost once a month do a six figure novation deal and it's always four or five, $600,000 properties, which is not the field we play on in wholesale and fix and flip. We stay at or below the median yeah. on rentals, fix and flips, and most of our wholesale deals. So, but from TV, and radio, I get leads sometimes on four, five, six. The highest novation we've ever done was a eight ninety nine um, list price on a property on twenty five acres, and uh, we made two hundred thousand dollars on that deal, gross before commissions. Wow! And I, you, I mean, I, it's really hard for me to make six figures on a two hundred seventy thousand dollar flip. Like, it just the, the margin's not there. So I, I really, really like higher price point novations because. We just make more money. Yeah. So uh, the interesting question I have is, I believe that it's more. We use the word you was use the word transparent when it comes to the novations, right? Being clear about the expectations. How do you overcome that line item on the closing statement that shows two hundred thousand dollars in that case? You know, so I think the real answer to that question is if we've done our job on the front end and you're not overcoming anything, we've already had this conversation. And part of our process is, which again, everybody has their own approach, but the methodology that we use in negotiating is not, hey, Dean, I can sell it for 600. You know, I've worked up a renovation scope. It's going to cost me 150 to renovate it. And I want to make a reasonable profit. And here's the logical explanation of how I arrived at my price. The problem with that is, is that you either have to disclose to the person up front exactly what your profit's going to be, which I don't think you have to do. Number two is you either have to, if you want to make six figures, but you want them to only think you're making 40, you have to lie. You either have to underestimate the ARV or you have to overestimate the renovation, which is lying, right? It's a strategic mistake on your part. That's called lying. So the way that we arrive at our offer, never like internally, we make a decision about the max we can pay based on that logical calculation. But when we're talking with the seller about what we're going to offer, it's never a logical explanation of ARV and reno and profit and all that stuff. So when we get to the point to where we've pitched a novation, I'm going to say, Dean, listen, there's four different ways that this deal could work out. If you and I make a deal and you give me permission to take it to the open market, I'm going to list it four different ways. One, as is, I'm not going to touch it, but I'm going to give a buyer the opportunity to do a full-blown home inspection, and I'm going to live with the consequences of that. I may have to renegotiate with them. I may have to give them a credit. They may want me to fix that roof that both you and I think is perfectly fine. I'm going to have to fight that bottle. Number two is someone that'll buy it in its current condition, but maybe they want a roof put on the property. As long as I've accounted for that in my price, I may be comfortable spending 10 grand on a roof and doing it after settlement. Don't worry. I would never want to do renovations on your home before you and I have gotten the settlement and you've gotten paid. Number three is maybe they want a roof and the wife absolutely has to have a brand new white kitchen with quartz countertops. Now, the good news is retail and that's probably 25 grand. I can get kitchens done sometimes for $15,000. So if a buyer came to me and they wanted that work done, it honestly creates another opportunity for me to make a couple more bucks. Option four is the HGTV buyer. They come to me and they want to buy your house from me, but they want it fully renovated. 
They'll give me five pages of things they want to get done. Now, again, don't worry. I would never do this while you're still living in the property. We would only make this deal if they paid me every last dollar I would ever hope the house would sell for. Honestly, I hope it's a million bucks. And then I would do the renovations after you and I have gone to settlement. Now, what happens? If I'm making 100 grand on the settlement sheet, what do you think a buyer or a seller may assume about that gap in price? You're going to be doing the remodel. I'm certainly not going to lie to them. If they ask me, do not lie. If you're listening to this, don't say what I just said and then have them ask you, oh, yeah, we're going to rehab it if that's not the case. But what we do is literally, and then when we list it, we'll say, ask agent about possible renovations. Now, here are the secret. When they go, I want to get it fully remodeled, I go, Dean, we're not super excited about those deals. We think it's going to sell as is. I would tell your buyer to consider making an offer in its current condition. And in in today's market, we've, I've never, I haven't had to do that in, Gosh, I bet it's been 10 years. I've had to do any level of renovation to a property. But we offer it for sale that way. It is something that I would consider. And we put it right in the listing remarks so that any seller would follow up with us and look at what it says on Zillow or Redfin or Realtor.com. What we said and what they see matches up. And I think that's why when we get to the Mm. settlement, we don't get much pushback. Now, I've had a couple where we were making, I think one was like 50 grand. The other was 70. We've made you know, some some big rips and some sellers push back, but they could never say, I didn't know what was going on. They could never say, you weren't honest with me. They could never say, you didn't explain this to me. We actually celebrate and go, Dean, you'll never guess what happened. We got so fortunate. We found a buyer much quicker than we thought we were going to. And honestly, they paid us an arm and a leg. The great news is we're going to get you to settlement much quicker than what I expected. And we've already gone ahead and taken care of the transfer tax for you. We're going to put a couple extra bucks in your pocket. Again, if you do enough deals, you're going to have some problem customers and some problem transactions. But as long as you're saying what I said on the front, you're disclosing our paperwork package over discloses the fact that we desire to make a profit. And we just don't have, I mean, again, we'll do probably close to 200 of these deals a year and average over $35,000 a transaction. And we just don't get many, you know, people that are upset or, or push back or, um, even complain about it because we're just super, super transparent on the front end. So that's interesting. Um, I was thinking about that when it comes to the communication between the front end team for your acquisitions yeah. and the back end team of the decision makers around what exit strategy are we going to do? How are we going to put this on the market? How, how are we going to market it? What's the language in it? All those things have to be in sync. How do you make sure that your team is in sync to to what is communicated with the seller up front is also accurate as can be with how you're communicating that on the back end? So we have a standard way that we list every innovation. Now, some of the language around the description of the specific property is obviously unique to that property, but the way that we disclose um, possible renovations is the exact same every single time. Okay. The, 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 the 30,000 foot view is, I think what happens is, like you said, front end team, back end team. I think the, the answer to that question is there needs to be a definitive handoff of what the front end, because front end to you and front end to me might be two different things. Like our acquisitions agent job is terminated the instant they get a contract. They literally have zero responsibility from there on out. Right. We, we have an, uh, we have two people in TC. There's an inward facing communication person that handles title company, our team, vendors, appraisers, and then we have an outward facing TC that handles all customer communication, right? So like you have to have a definitive handoff between front end, TC, and back end, and basically just have documented processes about how those decisions are made so that there's not confusion about who should be doing it and then how they should be doing it. Yeah, that makes sense. Which if the answer, if it's anything like me, I had to go hire someone that was good at that stuff because I'm an absolute operations <laughs> nightmare. <laughs> so let's, let's end on that. Let's talk about how you create at scale a business like this. What are some of the key things along the way? You know, you said you focused on the people rather than the support. And I think that message stood out to me. So maybe we start with how do you find those people And then two, how do you get the right systems in place, whether it's just through learning lessons and what are some of the lessons learned there, 
or is it just like, here's the, the, the golden ticket, go hire this company and they'll make all your problems go away? Um, I think it's a combination of each, depending on um, how quickly you want to get this done and what you're willing to pay for it. So I think uh, for every business owner that goes from like startup to where they want to hire their first person, um, they should read Traction um, about EOS. I think that's a very elementary book. A thousand people have probably given them that advice and it'll give you the basic fundamentals of like uh, reporting, goal setting, and communication on a team. Um, or uh, for me, I've hired a bunch of coaches, um, first one being EOS, Gary and Susan Harper, um, who have implemented, I think, over 500. They've worked with over 500 local real estate investors in the U.S. to implement um, their EOS curriculum. And now they've developed the new curriculum called RISE, which is a um, a new version of, of something similar to, to EOS. Um, I've ventured into, um, have you ever heard of Vern Harnish? Um, it's called Mastering the Rockefeller Habits. So these are specifically for businesses that are built to be sold or exited in some capacity. Um, so my beginning phase was EOS, and that's how I, I really got to a place to where I had two or three good managers and 20 employees. And then once I got to a place to where I wanted to exit completely the day-to-day, um, I started implementing the scaling up curriculum that's uh, designed and facilitated by a guy named Vern Harnish. And it's based on the Rockefeller habits that are 200 years old. So you, you've you said a lot of things that I've heard too, just in terms of like, what are, what are the right things to follow with traction? Um, I've heard about Gary Harper as well. That's something I messaged my partner just a couple of weeks ago saying, hey, I think we should look into this because I've had you and several others say how, oh, Gary came in and did this, that, and the other. So what, what was it about that experience? Was it things that you just flat out did not have at all? Yes. Or was it making sure I need to make the things I'm doing better? Um, I would say there was probably three or four things that they introduced to us as basic operating principles that were completely off my radar. We came up with a set of core values that I, I won't I won't take a lunch date with someone unless I know that they align with my core values. I mean, we certainly won't hire anybody without understanding what their value system is. Um, a, a, a definitive um, mission and purpose behind the company. Like, why is it that we do what we do? What's the bigger picture? Why do we get up in the morning? Right. Like, so we have a definitive purpose inside of this company. And then we've driven that down to each individual person. Like, we know what every individual's person is that works here, why they get up in the morning and what the most important thing to them is in life. Um, So, those three things for me. And then having a predetermined set of metrics that we meet on each morning and each week to hold each other accountable to. Um, You know, we would have goals and metrics and, We would talk about profit throughout the week, but we didn't have a definitive set of metrics that each person, each department committed to and then had to come to the meeting and say, this was my number. I failed last week. I need your help or said, this was my number. I hit my number and everybody give them a pat on the back. Um, Those were probably the four key principles that I took away from Gary and Susan that then sort of opened my eyes to all these other things that we could be doing better. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's the modern day hack is to, to pay for the experience and, and get someone to show you the path of success that others have had. And yeah. I mean, these are things that are so simple to understand and things that I understood when I first got started, but I just, I, I had these limiting beliefs that held me back and was convinced that I had to do it on my own and I couldn't afford it and all these other things. But as I've, more recently invested into these things. It's just opened up so many more doors, so many more opportunities, uh, made me aware of how I could be doing things better. I mean, it's just, it's infinitely better when you, you know, put yourself in the right community, you get the right information. And I mean, I know we're, we're both believers of that. I mean, if you think about it, right, like from professional sports team, like football teams, right, they have a set of core values. They have a playbook. They have a scheme. Right. Like they, they, what, what offense do you run? Like 
we're the only people crazy enough to think that we can go out and spend and generate millions of dollars by the seat of our pants. And, and for the most part, the worst thing that happens is we have success in the beginning and we think that like, we're just, I'm God's gift to sales. I'm the best real estate investor that ever existed. Yeah. And it's not until we get punched in the face a couple of times and fall from glory where we're like, man, I don't want to climb that, 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 that wall again, just to fall, right? Like, how can I be smarter about scaling that and growing it again so that I'm less likely to fall? And if I do, that's a much shorter fall and I can start climbing again. And for me, that became, and what so the, the second thing I learned with systems or the first thing I learned was the value of systems and processes. The second thing was, I'm not going to do that crap and I need to hire someone that's good at it, right? Because <laughs> That's why we generally don't do it as visionaries. We start companies, but we always need um, that number two. That's an operations person to grow the company, or we just end up scaling chaos. Yeah. There's no question. Yeah. Well, dude, it's been so fun to have you on. I know uh, I could sit here and talk to you for hours. Um, I look forward to talking to you more and, and, and peeling back more. So um, again, for those of you that want to connect with Eric, you can find him on Instagram, Eric, underscore brewer underscore invest that's right yeah yep nailed it okay and um any any last words for the audience eric um in the spirit of gary and susan gary and and susan did a really good job of sort of opening my eyes to operations and being a good leader gary reminds me all the time to just keep going and uh that's what i would encourage you to do if you're listening to this and you're seeking some motivation if you're seeking some clarity if you're um, seeking the answer to to some questions is just keep going. Yeah, that's often the answer. Um, we think we're we think we've we failed. We think uh, we can't quite get there, but it's just you just got to keep going. You just got to give some more effort, and that's when the breakthroughs will happen. That's been my strategy with children. I'm at six now, and I just keep <laughs> going. So I figure there's got to be some merit to it, right? Yeah, that's right. Well, awesome, man. Eric, it's been a pleasure to have you on. Thank you so much for being here, man. Until next time, peace. See you, man.